My role today, as uh, Nivo has said, is uh, um, to introduce the links between energy and society uh, under the viewpoint of sustainability. And only very briefly, I will uh, enter into the link between water and energy because other speakers will be covering that. Um, as you will see in a moment, I shall try today to break my world record of 300 slides in 15 minutes. Uh, please try to keep up with me. Um, okay, so um, just one week ago, uh, this document was published by the United Nations Environmental Program uh, in anticipation of a big event that will take place in 10 days. Uh, do you know which event is that? In Rio de Janeiro? The Earth Summit, which is the, uh, the 20th anniversary of a big event, another Earth Summit that happened in Rio de Janeiro in 1992 that uh, basically made worldwide known uh, the concern about sustainable development. And uh, we are uh, during uh, this year uh, having this event and in anticipation for that uh, this document has been uh, published uh, indicating how are we doing regarding the major concerns about the sustainability of our civilization model and what the document says just starts by saying the currently observed changes to the earth system are unprecedented in human history and despite our efforts we have not succeeded in reversing adverse environmental changes. And abrupt and possibly irreversible changes to the life support functions of the planet are likely to occur. So the message is a um, dark one. Um, so uh, let's start by thinking about what sustainable development is and whether, given that my role is talking about energy, our energy model is sustainable or not. The definition that was published in a document called Our Common Future in 1987 and made very popular after this Earth Summit in Rio in 1992, the definition of sustainable development is a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And as I said, well, uh, we have to ask ourselves whether our civilization is sustainable and given that we rely so strongly on energy, whether our present energy model is sustainable or not. And under the viewpoint of energy, um, sustainability means three things. One, the environmental impact should be tolerable. Second, our development should allow adequate economic growth or, I mean, the, do these two characteristics. One, that we should have lasting, affordable, and dependable access to primary energy resources. And second, that that doesn't mean necessarily that we have to grow indefinitely in consumption of material resources. And the third leg, the third pillar, is social acceptability. And a basic ingredient of that social acceptability is that we should have reasonably fair universal access worldwide to modern forms of energy supply. We are going to examine whether we meet these three criteria. And well, worldwide, all the serious organizations that have examined this issue coincide that our model of energy production and consumption, even with the presently expected policy measures, is not sustainable. You can see that in documents like the World Energy Outlook published by the International Energy Agency uh, and many others, by the UN, etc. And we have three major concerns. One about access to lasting, dependable and affordable energy resources. Another one that about our environmental impact. And the third one about the unacceptable disparity of the levels of energy access and consumption. So let's examine each one of these three uh, pillars in more detail. 
The first one is the availability of primary energy resources. Uh, in this document that was published one week ago, we see that the primary drivers of energy consumption are the growth in population and the um, growth in, which is here in, in, um, la, in green, and the growth in well-being, in income per capita, and we have that the income in, um, in pink at the top. And of course, well, that drives energy consumption that is uh, dark uh, blue and uh, the emissions of CO2 in red. And that happens despite our efforts to improve the efficiency with which you use energy. These are the lines at the bottom uh, that, that, that we are improving in that. And we are also improving in emissions per unit of wealth, of unit of GDP. But still with that, we have this growth. If we extrapolate that growth uh, into the future, again, this is the, the last report of the International Energy Agency, and you see that with different trajectories uh, under different hypotheses, the uh, world primary energy is growing from now to 2035, which is the horizon that they are studying. And if we look at the composition of our primary energy resources, we see that at the bottom we have oil, then we have coal, then we have gas, so basically, 75% of our energy uh, primary uh, needs, I mean, um, um, resources come from fossil fuels. Then we have nuclear, hydro, biomass, and other renewables growing fast, but starting with a very small base. Um, if we look at, well, how much is left of those resources, probably this is not the right question because there will be always some fossil fuels left. What happens is that the cost of extracting them and processing them probably uh, in after some time will be uh, too expensive. Um, you see uh, in the uh, bottom right-hand side, which is the number of years that with current consumption and with the current uh, reserves, uh, they will last. So uh, in green, you have oil, about 40-something years. Uh, then we have uh, um, gas, and then you have uh, coal. Of course, that changes with new discoveries, and, but it also changes with the increment in demand um, um, needs. Um, just very briefly, because that, uh, others will touch that, uh, the link between uh, the, the production and consumption of energy and water is described in this plot in which you see in this table um, what are the, uh, in, in quantity and impacts on the quality of water, uh, the impacts of extraction and production uh, of oil and gas and uh, uranium, so the mining that uses a certain quantity of water and, um, well, um, in, uh, has an impact on the quality of that water in pollution. Uh, then in electricity generation, uh, the amount of water that is used for cooling, basically, and also cleaning. And um, then you have in refining and processing and also in transport and storage. You have different um, areas in which the um, uh, energy activities will impact on water. Just to give you an example of a message that is, I think is important, if you look at one country, for instance, United, the, the U.S., and uh, you see the source of water on the left and the sinks of water on the right. You see that the, um, at the bottom right over here, you see the consumption and evaporation, so how much water is, is being used and um, is consumed. And for thermoelectric cooling, so in the production of electricity, you see that a lot of water comes there but very little is really consumed. Uh, while in uh, irrigation, uh, there is a lot of water that is consumed or evaporated. Uh, so there is a lot of use and, and small consumption. And you have also here mining, so you see the proportions of the, how the water is used. I'm sure that others will cover that later. So the second pillar is environmental impact. In environmental impact, I will concentrate on climate change. And, well, the concern is whether humans in our activities will be, will be able to have a significant impact on something as important as the Earth climate. 
Well, it happens that the atmosphere is something very thin. It's like a, a layer of varnish on a balloon, very thin, a few kilometers wide, and it is quite fragile. And uh, it is affected by our activities. Uh, you see here on the right the plot of how the concentration of equivalent CO2, uh, greenhouse gases, has been increasing for the last century and a half. And you see on the left the, uh, the path of the, how the temperatures have been also um, changing. And you see a correlation. Well, if you look at the last 600,000 years, uh, the correlation between concentration of CO2 and temperature is fairly clear. Um, that doesn't mean that one is, is really causing the other. Uh, the, the relationship is very complex, but the correlation is very strong and it's very clear. Well, what happens now, and this is again a plot that comes in this report by the United Nations one week ago. Again, you have here the, well, in this case, is 800,000 years. And then you have, the important thing is that, is that in 1958, we had this level of CO2 concentration. This is the level in 2007. This is the level in 2011. So we are running an experiment with our planet that has, is unprecedented in the last 800,000 years. And this is what is the matter of concern. Uh, again, in this report, they have the uh, changes in temperature, average temperature of the, of the um, surface air um, around the globe, um, and what well, you have here the, uh, at the bottom, the number of uh, degrees centigrade, you see that in, in orange or uh, light red, you have lots of regions, and that means one or two degrees of increase in temperatures. And some, in some areas, in the uh, North Pole, we have increments of about four degrees. So it is really the warming global warming is really taking place. Uh, impacts, well, there are many, and I cannot cover all those. Something that is very striking is that if uh, the, the level of the, the, the sea rises, some countries, uh, like Maldives here, uh, will disappear. If you have the melting of, let's say, the, in Greenland, the ice, all that, uh, this is a, a depiction, it's not reality of what would happen in one of our touristic areas, La Manga, um, with um, a few meters of uh, more um, and higher level of the sea. Uh, the third pillar is the lack of universal access. And for that, what we mean is, well, universal energy access would be access to energy services that are clean, reliable, and affordable for cooking, heating, lighting, health, communications, and productive uses. And well, we have to remember that this is the, by the UN, this year has been designated the year to be concerned about universal access for energy access for all. And well, how are we doing in that? Poorly. Uh, the circles here mean uh, the number of um, million uh, people without access to electricity uh, now, which amounts to 1.4 billion people. And uh, on the right of the, the, the right circle is the estimation uh, of how many people would have without access to electricity with the current policies in uh, 2035. And you see that, well, it improves slightly in several um, continents and some areas. It gets worse in sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, the, the problem doesn't exist in the, well, in Europe or North America. Um, so I was asked also to talk about my current research topics. And they are related to my current activities, which have to do with energy regulation. So the question that I'm trying to contribute to is how to improve, redesign energy regulation to facilitate the implementation of sustainable policies. And if we look at the, the, the areas in which we could make a contribution, to this problem, um, well, these components have to be there. And with arrows, I am indicating the areas in which I'm more or less uh, trying to do some contribution. Um, one is examining the strong penetration of renewable energy sources. We will need energy efficiency and conservation measures. 
Uh, nuclear is another possibility with a question mark because of the uh, obvious uh, implications. Uh, energy uh, research and development in many topics uh, that some of you are working on, photovoltaic, capture and storage of CO2, biofuels, fuel cells, nuclear energy. Um, uh, the topic of regulation, all these uh, developments have to be finally uh, inscribed, written into laws that will incentivize investment and activities in, the, in clean technologies. And without proper regulation, things will not happen. And regulation could be, could be market instruments, could be command and control measures. Then we need, at global level, environmental diplomacy and international cooperation with developing countries. We need education to create social awareness and response and demands from the citizens that these things are given priority. And we need flexibility because we have to use uh, many options altogether. And well, uh, the European Union just one year ago published this roadmap on how to do on climate change. What are the commitments that, the, that Europe would have in climate change? And you see uh, how the different sectors have to reduce emissions and reduce them to one fifth of what they are now. And in particular, in the area in which I am working, I've been working for many years, the power sector has to go to zero. So we are talking not a minor changes. We are talking about lots of innovation, a drastic revolutionary change in how we produce electricity and use electricity. And so the challenges for the 21st century for power systems, well, they have to be fully decarbonized by 2050. How should be they transformed? How to support, because power systems will have to enter into transport and will have to enter into heating, that if we want them to be uh, clean, um, most of that or a large fraction of it will have to be provided by electricity, clean electricity how to integrate large amounts of intermittent or distributed generation, how to make full use of technologies of information and telecommunication, how to incorporate consumer response and choice, how to plan and build a huge volume of new infrastructure that is required, particularly, for instance, transmission lines, how to encourage innovation and new business models that are required for all this to happen, how make markets and governments compatible, the regulation that will guide markets to do the right thing, and all that reliably, efficiently, and with acceptable environmental impact. It's a huge challenge. So my current research topics have to be with the assessment of large scale penetration of intermittent renewable generation in the design and the operation of electricity markets, how to plan, deploy, and regulate the uh, transmission and distribution networks, how to reconcile policy objectives and markets, doing planning models, running models, exploring the future, uh, setting targets and see how to get there, uh, provision of universal access to electricity, the business models that will, be, will make possible. Uh, great news from one month ago, the European Union has committed to solve one third of the problem of universal access to electricity by 2030, and uh, well, how to think of the, the business of the electric utility of the future uh, under this uh, environment. And well, today, just to tell you that this is something very, very hot news, um, at 10.45, you would have the option uh, to watch the live stream of the General uh, Director for Energy at the European Commission, Philip Lowe, and eminent people uh, talking about the, what are the Europe's technology innovation needs to meet or exceed the 2050 energy roadmap targets. So this is a topic that is being talked about in Europe, and it is a topic that, that is a very much, uh, is very, very, very timely. And just to finish, a few images that for those of you who are not familiar with uh, this area could maybe give you a glimpse of what is the, what we are trying to do. Um, this is uh, one week of the demand in a typical power system that has uh, nuclear power plants, coal power plants, and gas turbines, combined cycles or single cycle turbines. And then let's see what happens what, if you have uh, solar penetration. By, well, in Spain we have a lot of solar already. In Italy they have 13 gigawatts. In, um, in, in Germany, they have had like 20 gigawatts of production of solar PV 
just a couple of weeks ago. So we are talking about very large penetration that is coming. So what happens if you introduce solar in this system? Well, um, this is five gigawatts of solar in a system like the Spanish one. This is 10, this is 15, this is 20, this is 25, this is 30. So you see that the composition of the mix of the technologies changes completely. Uh, coal disappears, gas has to be combined with, uh, with um, solar. So this is the type of things that you have to explore in the future, which is the right mix of technologies that you have to use, and what are the implications on costs and emissions and all these things. Um, well, when we talk about uh, networks, um, if we talk about uh, large offshore deployments of wind in the North Sea, or we talk about um, uh, concentrated solar power plants, uh, solar plants in Northern Africa and bringing all that to Europe, that means a lot of transmission lines. And uh, we don't know how to plan uh, transmission networks at that huge level uh, of European-wide, including Africa, including the North Sea, and with a lot of uncertainty. Uh, so a huge problem is how to plan those networks and how to define the business models that will make investors to build and to build that, how allocate to allocate the costs of those networks, how to convince people that uh, about siting. And um, well, if you go other places in the world, United States, they are discussing hotly how to bring the, the wind from the, uh, the plains in the Midwest to the, to the East Coast where the demand is with all these big lines. Some other people are talking about a overlay of transmission lines covering the whole country, the same thing that they did with the highways um, many years ago. So um, these are the problems of our time in when we look at, uh, look at um, electricity. If we talk about universal energy access, uh, this is Cajamarca, Peru, and you have people without electricity living in dispersed areas. What are the business models that we could have to create to bring private investment to, uh, to these areas uh, that are sparsely populated with people with low income, but of course in need of electricity to live a decent life, and how to regulate that and establish the tariffs and the social networking to maintain these installations. Um, and uh, this is one of the houses in, in this area with the solar panels on the top. And uh, fortunately, they have electricity because of um, uh, some um, pilot projects that are taking place and that have to be extended widely to cover the, uh, the 1.4 billion people without electricity. So the, the role of your generation is to invent the future. Uh, we have to learn how to grow better and not to grow more. Uh, we have to change the paradigm of continued statistical growth to a new paradigm of deliberate restraint and moderation. Only radical innovation research in our energy model will make this possible, and this has to guide your careers. Thank you very much.